to do it, and some agencies invite me out because that's kind of how I make my living this, these days. So fortunately, I got to work with the um, Community Recreation of uh, Toronto today. Did a full day workshop with them. So, uh, but what I'm really passionate about is community. So I, I've really been looking forward to this. And I'm also passionate about neighborhoods. Uh, and Toronto is well known for having fantastic neighborhoods. And I got to walk around your business district. Uh, saw the fantastic park out here. You got a dynamic neighborhood. I love it. So, as I said, I'm absolutely passionate about community. Um, I think there's a role for government, there's a role for nonprofit organizations of all kinds, but there's absolutely no substitute for community when it comes to the things we care most deeply about. I'm going to share a few stories to illustrate that. And a number of the stories are based on a program we developed in Seattle out of the Department of Neighborhoods called the Neighborhood Matching Fund. That's what Catherine wrote about. And the idea was that our neighborhood groups were really angry at City Hall, because they said City Hall's always putting its money into big projects for developers downtown, and never enough into the priorities for our neighborhoods. And our city's excuse was, look, if we did that project for your neighborhood, we'd set a precedent. We'd have to do it for all the neighborhoods. We can't afford to do it for all the neighborhoods. We're not going to do it for any neighborhood. So I said, for projects like that, projects have been a priority for neighborhoods, but not for City Hall. How about if we meet the community halfway? How about if we provide a cash match from the city in exchange for the community's equal match of volunteer labor or donated goods and services in support of a community-initiated project? And how about if we open this up to any group of neighbors so you don't have to go through those gatekeepers. You can just, any group of neighbors wants to come together to do a project. And how about if we just fund one-time projects because the idea is to build capacity rather than dependence. So we aren't going to fund staff or operating costs, just one-time projects. And how about if all the funding decisions are made by the neighborhood leaders themselves? So I took this idea to the city council. It was very controversial. Why should we put any money into projects that aren't our priority when we don't have enough money for everything that is? Finally, on a vote of five to four, not exactly a mandate, they approved $150,000 for the first year of the neighborhood matching fund. That first year, we supported 22 community self-help projects. They were so popular that the next year, our council voted unanimously to increase the fund to one and a half million dollars. They subsequently increased it to four and a half million dollars a year. This year, we celebrate the 25th anniversary of that program in Seattle. Over that time, there have been more than 5,000 community self-help projects. There's evidence of them in absolutely every neighborhood, greatly reinforcing what's special about that place, contributing to the quality of life. The city's $60 million investment over the years has leveraged $85 million in community resources. That under the old model, where people were looking to government to do everything, never would have been tapped. But the best benefit is it's newly involved tens of thousands of people in community life because we've finally given people a way to get involved other than going to meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I mean, you can relate to that. Yeah. So I'm going to share a few stories from that as I illustrate the unique power of community. Now, I think one of the key powers of community is the power to care for the earth. Climate change is a huge, huge challenge. And we aren't getting any closer to dealing with it. And we aren't going to get there just through regulation and just through green technology. <coughs> People actually have to adopt it. People have to change the way they live. And I think people will only do that if they feel some sense of connection with each other in the place they share. Some sense that my actions are going to make a difference. Otherwise, why, why would I recycle? Why, would I, why not waste the energy? I'm just one person on this huge planet. I'm not going to make a difference. But it's in community that we feel some sense of responsibility, some sense of accountability, some sense that collectively our actions are going to make a difference. So the first story I'm going to share is from our Ballard neighborhood. And our neighborhoods are like your neighborhoods. You know, but I'm not talking about our city with a population of 700,000. I'm talking about a neighborhood with 5,000 or 10,000 people, much smaller scale. So Ballard is a neighborhood in Seattle that had the least number of street trees of any neighborhood in Seattle. They also had the fewest number of parks outside of downtown Seattle. There was a woman in Ballard named Dravilla Gowan. She cared passionately about trees. She wanted to see trees up and down the streets of her neighborhood. So she put notices in the Bauer News Tribune. She put them in the corner grocery store. She put them in the church bulletin, advertising for other people who shared her passion. If nobody came forward, she would go to that block and try to find somebody 
and talk to them until she convinced them that they shared her passion for street trees. Wow. Then she got that person to sign a pledge form, saying, I'll come to a training about how to plant and take care of the trees. I'll recruit my neighbors to do the same thing. She turned in all of her pledge forms with her matching fund application. One day, trucks pull into her neighborhood with 1,080 trees. Dropped them off in every block and valley. Durville went and knocked on the door of the block captain, said the trees are here. Block captain knocked on the neighbor's door. That day, over 1,000 people came out, planted trees up and down the streets. People felt incredibly empowered. At the beginning of the day, there's no street trees. At the end of the day, they had tree-lined streets. Look what we can do when we work together as a community. But we still have the least number of parks. So they walked around the neighborhood looking for potential park sites. They had a hard time finding them because the neighborhood is pretty developed. But they finally found this old rundown house used to serve as a nursery. Property was overgrown, huge public safety problems right next to the business district. They convinced the city government to buy that property for a park. And the city had some open space bond money to buy the property, but absolutely no money to design or build the park. So the neighbors did it themselves. Local landscape architect volunteered her, volunteered her services and worked with the other neighbors. And together, they designed and built Baker Park. This is the entranceway into the park. This is some of the landscaping. There were some beautiful old trees in this park because it used to be a nursery. One of them had died. They're trying to figure out how to remove it. And then one of the neighbors, who was Native American, had a better idea and carved it in place at the totem. <laughs> and here's some of the detail. This group went on the next year and they tore up all the asphalt around the school. The first gray to green project in Seattle. We see innovations coming out of community all the time that never come out of the bureaucracy. Yeah. Much better for the environment. The water can percolate through the soil. Creates green space for the kids, for the neighbors. Fantastic. Now we're doing it around a lot of our schools in Seattle. This, is, uh, this was planted as a street. There are houses on either side. The property is owned by our transportation department, but it was never developed because it's too steep. Cars could never make it to the top. So as a result, it never got paved. It just became overgrown. Huge problem with rodents. The only thing that tried to go up were four-wheel drive vehicles. They come in the middle of the night, break racer engines, you know, and squeal their tires, challenging each other to make it to the top. Driving the neighbors totally crazy. I really thought the neighbors were crazy because they went out with picks and shovels. They dug through the heavy, hard pan clay soil by hand. They hauled those timbers up the side. They terraced that whole problem hillside and turned that problem hillside into a community garden. This is now one of 85 organic community gardens in the city of Seattle, all built by neighbors. 7,000 urban gardeners, and collectively they donate three tons of organic produce to our food banks every year. This is the group's most recent project. This is the site of another former house. So to commemorate the house, they built all the furniture out of cement. <laughs> and the dedication for this park, they unveiled a timeline that shows the 20 parks they built in the past 20 years. Every one of them with volunteers. They built ball fields. They built playgrounds. They've renaturalized natural areas. They're restoring a salmon estuary. They worked with the kids to build a skate park. 20 parks in 20 years, one neighborhood. They said, well, this is great. We've made our neighborhood a much better place, but we're concerned about what's happening to the planet. We're concerned about climate change. So they organized an all-volunteer group called Sustainable Ballard. And every summer for the past seven years, they've had a Sustainable Ballard Fest in their park. And they have music and food to lure people in. And then they got booths to educate neighbors about what they can do to reduce their carbon footprint. And the first booth you go to is the undriver's license station, where you go and check all the ways you will not drive over the next month. And when you do, you get a laminated undriver's license, which entitles you to drive the shuffle bus. This is a foot-powered mobile. It's like Fred Flintstone going down the street. Gets everybody's attention. Gets people thinking, what can I do to get out of my car? What can I do to reduce my carbon footprint? This has created a movement now. All the neighborhoods around Ballard have organized their own all-volunteer sustainability groups. All the suburban communities around Seattle have done the same. We now have 67 of these all-volunteer groups, and collectively they call themselves Scallops, Sustainable Communities All Over Puget Sound. It all started with Derville Gowan and those street trees 20 years ago.
There's incredible untapped potential in our community. It's the only way we're going to deal with climate change. 